Good morning. I'm Merit Jano, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs, and it's my great privilege to welcome you to today's discussion on new threats, old thinking, in conflict resolution, is it due for a makeover? The study of conflict at SEPA crosses many fields um, and uh, areas of focus uh, at Columbia and at, SUP, at SEPA. For our students, uh, there is a degree focus on international conflict resolution. For our faculty, we have many faculty who are doing research around conflict related to global peace and security, looking at conflict both intrastate and interstate, looking at the United Nations, uh, its roles and its doctrines uh, around peace and security, around atrocity prevention. But we also look at the intersection of conflict and the environment, and also uh, around areas of new uh, conflict zones, such as cyber conflict and misinformation. So the ways in which we study conflict, I think are very, very broad, whether covering development, or uh, security directly or geopolitically, regionally, and other dimensions. And we're blessed to have a faculty uh, of both scholars and practitioners who engage deeply in the world. And so for this reason, among many others, we were particularly excited to be able to announce uh, this last year an ability to engage still further with the uh, creation of the Kent Global Leadership Program on conflict resolution. This new program was established with support from Mutar Kent, and it brings together practitioners and experts from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors to assess the current state of conflict and identify potential new approaches and importantly, uh, solutions. This program will include a week-long training program focused for diplomats and practitioners, a visiting professorship, student fellowships and additional program programming. And it is in that spirit that we inaugurate today's first event uh, sponsored by the Kent Global Program on Conflict Resolution. And I can't think of a better inaugural speaker than Peter Moore, who is with us today, president of the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is in some of the most difficult problems in the world today and does such important work around the world to assist victims of armed conflict and violence and support humanitarian uh, actions. We look forward to his insights on how conflict resolution is evolving around the world, the threats as you see them, the changes that you think might be necessary, and indeed it wasn't long ago um, when there was a great deal of optimism about a reduction in conflict, about preventative measures, and yet uh, recent years have seen a substantial increase uh, in certain kinds of conflicts. I also want to thank and welcome uh, Professor Jean-Marie Dano for moderating today's discussion. Um, and uh, also uh, I'm pleased uh, to welcome him back to Columbia where he will be joining us next spring as the inaugural visiting professor under the Kent. Uh, program. Uh, Professor Ambassador Gaino is a distinguished fellow in foreign policy at Brookings, a member of the UN Secretary General High Level Advisory Board on Mediation. He served as president of the International Crisis Group for four years. He ran our own center and programs on conflict resolution and was the longest serving Under Secretary General for peacekeeping operations at the United Nations between 2000 and 2008. So thank you, if I may, Jean-Marie, for joining us uh, and engaging in a conversation uh, with our distinguished guest. And finally, but with tremendous appreciation, I want to recognize Mutar Kent uh, for joining us uh, today. As you know, he is a former chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company and a deeply respected global corporate leader. And uh, as a result of an extraordinary life uh, uh, of global operations and exposure, uh, it was really uh, his thinking uh, of the value 
value of partnering uh, with an academic institution in thinking about conflict and conflict resolution in the world today. And we are honored uh, to be his partner and undertake this program. So I'd like to start, if I may, by inviting Mutar Kent to share with us a little about the vision that led to the program. And then we'll have the great privilege of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Merit. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here and to welcome, uh, I want to just join you in uh, welcoming everyone who joined this uh, webinar uh, today. Um, and I just can't be uh, more excited and more proud to um, have um, come up uh, together with uh, uh, Merit uh, uh, Janow this um, great idea of uh, how we can make a dent in uh, conflict resolution. As I um, traveled around the globe over the last 40 years um, uh, as an executive, um, I just saw, especially in the last 10 years, um, a, a um, failure in, in prevention of uh, conflict, a conflict of all, all kinds, uh, not just political conflict, but also conflict, uh, social conflict, um, business conflict, personal conflict, um, and, and, and so on. So um, I already um, had a foundation to support education and send uh, a number of um, uh, uh, high school graduates to college in the United States every year. So I thought, what else could I do to make a positive impact in the world and came up with uh, this idea of um, of partnering with um, Columbia's uh, SIPA school to see if we could, um, um, it, from a practical point of view, um, share ideas, share insights, share experiences in solving uh, conflicts of, of different uh, nature. And the idea here was that uh, we would for, for have a, create a program together with Columbia that would bring together uh, um, leaders from um, what I call the golden triangle of, 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 polit uh, of, of, of politics, uh, of government politics on one side, business on the other side, and civil society leadership on the other side. And for those um, leaders to come and share their experiences and uh, how they uh, felt they, would, they made an impact, positive impact on creation, uh, on preventing uh, uh, conflict. And so uh, that's how the program started. And I'm so, so happy and honored that uh, Jean-Marie Gaino has uh, become uh, accepted to become the first visiting professor. We already have selected um, or in the process of selecting uh, scholars. And uh, this is the first event where we welcome uh, an amazing leader, Peter Mao, um, to uh, uh, have him share his experiences firsthand on on the, uh, how he uh, and his uh, tremendous organization is cre uh, preventing conflict on the ground. So very proud to be here, very proud um, to partner with uh, Merit and Columbia and um, over to you, thank you. Thank you very much. If I uh, now may I invite Jean-Marie to open up this session and uh, hear from our distinguished speaker. Well, it's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to uh, be part of that opening uh, event of the Mutaken program. And, uh, and it's a particular pleasure to have this conversation with Peter Maurer. Uh, I think we first met when you were the ambassador at the United Nations. Uh, then you became the state secretary. And eight years ago, uh, you uh, joined the ICRC as the, uh, running this enormous organization, which uh, for all of us is the is in a way the the epitome of uh, humanitarian action uh, the humanitarian principles were created uh, essentially by Henri Dunant and uh, by the Red Cross uh, and the Red Cross today is when I check the website and I invite uh, all the uh, listeners to look at the website which is extremely informative I saw that you have now no less than 19,000 staff you have a a $2 billion budget, which is about double what the budget was uh, when you joined. And uh, more importantly for our conversation today, you are present in 90 countries. And among those 90 countries, uh, all the countries which are in conflict. 
And so my, my first question to you, Peter, is uh, the ICRC is always the International Committee of the Red Cross is always seen in a way as the conduit of last resort. When uh, nobody can talk, uh, you are the organization that can establish links. But it seems that in our polarized world, it's more and more difficult to establish uh, those, those links. So what's your experience in those eight years? Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Jean-Marie, for the question. Uh, Mutter and Merit for a very kind introduction. I really appreciate uh, to be uh, the speaker to have this conversation this afternoon and uh, it's a great opportunity and an honor uh, for me as well. Uh, I will immediately go into the question but I wanted to make a, a preliminary remark which uh, is interesting in terms also on where the ICRC sees itself in the world. Uh, we are committed to neutral, impartial and independent humanitarianism. And there is obviously a tension between engaging on preventing conflict and on peace building when you are a neutral and impartial humanitarian because as a neutral and impartial humanitarian, you are supposed not to be political, but conflict prevention and peace building is in essence political work. What makes us acting as neutral and impartial humanitarians and having access to actors, to armed actors all over the world is most of the time not what is at the core of your research. And nevertheless, I hope this conversation will show and demonstrate that there are an enormous amount of bridges between humanitarian organization responding to needs of people, in particular from violence and conflict, and those who try to respond politically, diplomatically, in business terms and societal terms to building more peaceful societies. And I have to always remind when those humanitarian and peace come together to remind everybody that Henri Dunant was the first uh, honoree of the Peace Nobel Prize in 1901. And he got this prize not because he was a humanitarian, but because he had a vision for peace. And I wanted to make this short uh, pre preliminary remark just to set all those uh, also the stage and to explain a little bit the angle under which we look at many issues. As you rightly said, uh, Jean-Marie, we have experienced over the decades, but in particular over the last 10 years, a quite extraordinary explosion of actors, a fragmentation of actors in the battlefields in which we are. If we look at where we are coming from, the Geneva Conventions in the 19th century, the Geneva Conventions in 1949, and uh, the additional protocols of uh, 77 were all drafted in the light of conflicts where of state to state conflict and of conflicts with front lines and battlefields. And today, uh, when we look at the evolution over the last couple of years, what strikes most is definitely the number, the exploding numbers of armed actors in the contexts uh, in which we operate. If we look at uh, the 25 to 30 most intense conflict situations in which we are. We count hundreds of non-state armed groups while we have maybe 50, 60 states actively engaged with their armed forces directly or indirectly in those groups. We have certainly five to six times more non-state armed groups in which to operate. And this goes to the core of the difficulty we are encountering today because the basic approach of 
our organization has always been that in order to establish minimal trust amongst belligerents, which is the first precondition to find pathways out of conflict and war, you needed to start to talk with everybody. So this everybody today is not anymore 196 state signatories of the Geneva Conventions, but in addition to those states, it is also 500 or six or 700 non-state armed groups. And if I look at the 25 most violent conflicts in which we are, the, the lowest number is those conflicts where we have one to five parties to the conflicts. Most of our conflicts have more than 10, 15 parties to conflict which fight with each other in varying alliances. And even mathematically, it's more difficult today to respond to the ambition of the organization to engage with each of these parties to conflict in order to ensure respect for basic rules and principles of war. And we know from experience that respect for basic principles of war is at the origin or at the end is at the starting point of reconciliation after war of not having society relapse into war and conflict and violence. And therefore, one of our biggest struggles today is very pragmatically said, a number issue. Uh, maintaining our engagement, understanding the structure of non-state armed groups, of state armed groups, their interaction, and also look at the complexity of some of the situations. You know it as well. Today, states don't find, fight wars openly. They find them, fight them through proxies, through non-state armed groups, through special operation and secret uh, activities. And here again, it's a big challenge and a challenge in the environment in which we, uh, with which we are confronted. I would mention a second important factor, Jean-Marie, and uh, to your question, and this, that this fragmentation of actors is combined with an urbanization of warfare. Not only the rest of the world urbanized, but conflict and war are carried into cities. Of course, we have still battlefields outside cities. Of course, we have battlefields in, in the bush and in, in many places. But if we look at the trend, uh, one of the most important trends over the last 10 years is the urbanization of warfare. It's the use of weapons and easily available weapons in very fragile contexts of urban situations. And this is again compounding some of the problems with which we are operating because the impact of warfare, of fragmented warfare in urban areas is bigger for the civilian populations than any time before. So uh, to Mutar, I have to explain all, always to a business person that Doubling the budget of, an organ of a humanitarian organization is not good news. Uh, it's, not, it's inverse to what it is in business. Doubling of resources within eight years of, an or of a humanitarian organization is a highly alarming uh, tribute to the complexity of issues that uh, we are dealing with. And the number of actors, the unstructured nature of actors uh, basically defies also some of the basic concepts which are at the origin of my organization uh, that we can easily identify civilians and militaries, state and non-state, internal and external actors, and all this gets very muddy in today's conflict. As I was listening to you, uh, Peter, I was thinking obviously of uh, Syria. Uh, I uh, suspect that Syria may be 
the num number one conflict, so to speak, where you have the, the greatest uh, involvement, although you are present in, in many, many countries. But I'd be interested, and I think all, our, um, all the participants would be interested in he hearing from you uh, how you can manage in a conflict like the Syrian conflict, uh, those principles of neutrality, impartiality, you have to deal with all the actors uh, you are not an organization that denounces that uh, and actually your strength is in uh, being able to uh, to keep relations even in the most difficult circumstances. How do you handle such a tragedy as Syria? Well, the honest answer is B, we can't handle a tragedy like Syria, but we can certainly try uh, to advance even in those contexts and as you rightly said Syria today is the largest operation of the ICRC in terms of our budget so uh, it's uh, an almost 190 million uh, operation with uh, 1000 ICRC staff on the ground with different offices uh, in the country and of course it's difficult in many respects uh, your question allows me maybe to, uh, to highlight two or three important points. One is, uh, as a humanitarian organization, you want to talk to all armed actors and all belligerents controlling territories and populations in order to have access and an ability to engage on the respect of the law. But Syria is the primary example of a context in which not everybody wants to talk to us. And therefore, it is a big challenge in many of today's fragmented contexts, not only that we sometimes don't know who is there, but those who are there do not necessarily wish to engage with a neutral and impartial actor or even consider neutral and impartial humanitarian activity as a hostile uh, intrusion into their, into their space. So it is extremely difficult. Having said that, what we really try in each and every context, be it Syria, Libya or others, to do is to really have a understanding and mapping on who is in control of what chunk of territory and what size of a population in order to see how we can start a conversation and hopefully a negotiation in order to change behavior of belligerents, in order to protect people or to have access in order to bring relief. And I think that's something which is sometimes difficult to understand and where I see a huge bridge to the peace building and peace research project, uh, program at SIPA. Because while we are a principled organization drawing our legitimacy from law and from the Geneva Conventions, we are also a practical organization working close to the field, to, to belligerents in order to negotiate conditions under which these principles and these humanitarian activities can unfold. And I think the core of pragmatism at the end of the day is to always find the balance between maintaining your principles being in between those multiple uh, polar systems and conflicts and at the same time get the trust of each other and negotiate practical arrangements which allow us to access people or to access detainees, to access, uh, to bring families together, to run through the core program which is basically legitimized by what the Geneva Convention allowed the ICRC to do or task it to do. And I think a context like Syria is indeed highly complex because uh, you want to be and have the ambition to be active in the whole of the country. And if you are in, want to be in the whole of the country, you need 
the trust from the government controlling 60-70% of the country and you need the trust of other groups and groupings. And partly we, have, we managed to do it. We have substantive activities today in the northeast of the country, uh, which is under different kinds of controls. Uh, we start to mount operations in the south of the country uh, increasingly again but it is a huge complexity to negotiate that consensus and trust, which is not a given, but can only happen over time. And with proximity and presence on the ground and personal and professional relationships developing. I think, uh, Getting the trust also of the civilian population is of critical importance. Uh, civilian population and what we can do for them are our strongest advocates and very often our strongest advocates who allow us to understand who the belligerents are, whom we have to talk to and what the environment in which we operate is. Thank you. We hear that more and more the conflict actors try to, to weaponize, in a way, uh, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian uh, aid. And that must create real ethical dilemmas for you, because, of course, saving life, I mean, any life uh, deserves to be saved. But at the same time, if uh, the support is channeled to a particular group rather than others, it does uh, create uh, political di dynamics that are dangerous. Uh, how can you manage, uh, how do you manage that ethical uh, dilemma? Well, indeed, Jean-Marie is uh, one of the big issue, but uh, of course, while we need to negotiate with those in control of territory and population, we also design our program towards needs of people. And I think that's where the subtlety lies. We, we are not an agency supplying humanitarian assistance to group controlling territory in order to support their governance on territories and population. We are negotiating in order to create that neutral and impartial space. And of course, it's one of the most difficult dilemmas you have. We certainly have a series of practices, guidelines, uh, experiences which allow us to do that. We, we don't pay to have access. We don't let tax our humanitarian delivery by those who grant us access in order to extract half of it for them and take it away from the civilian population in need. And so these are complex and complicated negotiations and I agree with you that very often it's a big dilemma on whether you save lives and you accept a certain deal in a certain circumstance in under certain circumstances or not you can't find a sort of a mathematical formula but it is also the experience of frontline negotiators which allow us then over time to find the right guidance it's not only a question of dilemma we have to to find ways out of dilemma. And that's, for instance, the reason why, together with HCR and World Food Programme and Doctors Without Borders over the last couple of years, we have created that Center for Frontline Humanitarian Negotiation in Geneva, which is basically an attempt to systematize frontline negotiation experience and help those who go into those new contexts support such, such difficult trade-offs and such difficult dilemmas. And we are convinced that the series of experiences that we have made 
have translated into guidance which today allows us to be rather satisfied with what our colleagues do in the field. We, we have done more than 100 interviews on how frontline negotiators really work and how they approach certain of the difficulties at the front lines. And we have captured it in a handbook, which we try also to train, to discuss, to bring into peer to peer support. So we cannot somehow solve the problems on a conceptual level, but we can solve it in terms of bringing experience to people and building on communities of practice, which then basically establish that system of checks and balances and allow to navigate some of the difficulties with which uh, we are confronted. We know that humanitarian work is intrinsically linked to dilemmas. You never get it clean. But it is also in, important to see what can you do in order to pick the best out of it. Because at the end of the day, what is so essential and which again builds the bridge to CPAS program is that at the basis of peace building, you have to have a minimal trust in society. Humanitarianism is the bottom line of trust that you try to establish. You need to build afterwards much on much more ambitious agenda. And I have seen from the concept note of the program that rightly so, there are much more ambitious agenda. But I think there is an interesting link. I give you a last example just to illustrate the dilemma part. As you have seen, we have negotiated uh, together with Martin Griffiths, the special representative from Yemen, the release of prisoners last weekend in Switzerland. Uh, of course, there are a lot of prisoners. Uh, is it ethical to release 1,081 in the first bunch? And what about the others? How do you think about those complex processes? It's a classical example where a frontline negotiation translates into a first stage, which hopefully brings a second stage, which hopefully brings a third stage, which hopefully creates trust amongst belligerents, which allows them also to charter new territories which are much more transformational, ambitious, and are much more designed to a negotiation of peace in a society. And it is not by chance that Martin, as the special representative of the UN and the ICRC, do this together because we see a continuum of trust building from humanitarianism to peace building, which is so important. But different organizations may have different roles, which doesn't prevent them to work together in order to have impact. And I think I wanted just to illustrate that because it, illustrate, it exemplifies some of the dilemmas which we are confronted, but it also shows that there are ways out of the dilemmas. Well, no, thank you for the, for the example. And, uh, it illustrates also the, the work you do with partners. And I would, I would want to, to hear from you, uh, with the immensity of the work before you, how do you, I mean, which partners do you work with? Uh, you mentioned uh, business as a possible partner and peace certainly needs ac economic activity. It needs uh, people who have a job, who can work, who can resume a normal life. Uh, how does the ICRC uh, broaden its reach uh, with, uh, with partners today? Well, first, let me say the, the first partner for us as a member of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent movement is also to work with national societies of the Red Cross and conflict regions and also to mobilize and work with and capacitate the volunteers of the Red Cross and Red Crescent in order to support humanitarian work. Because the interesting thing about 
us as a humanitarian organization with a legitimacy from state and a mandate from state is also that we are rooted in society. And our Red Cross volunteers and national societies are the first partner. But as you rightly say and suggest, Jean-Marie, while states support our humanitarian work and relief operation, we also need to create an environment and a social economic environment in which people can stabilize their lives and livelihoods and communities. And so over the last couple of years, we have seen an important transformation of humanitarian work. While 15, 20 years ago, the essence of humanitarian work was that an organization like mine would bring what is lacking in regions and communities exposed to war and violence and would bring in basically the essential goods of day-to-day -day life, food, medicine, uh, water, sanitation, shelter. That was the classic of humanitarianism and it's still important in, in many parts of the world. But conflicts have become longer and longer, more protracted, more complex. And when we listen carefully to people we serve, what they want is a perspective for their future. They don't want handouts. They want pathways to independent lives. And therefore we need to understand humanitarianism also in this respect in a much more comprehensive way build and support small businesses in particularly fragile contexts, trying to help those who are displaced, not only to get aid, which is necessary temporarily, but also to become aid independent over time. And this is not possible in the strict concept of humanitarian work, which is still for many states who support us fundraising in order to spend on emergency. And so we have grown over time our socio-economic projects, which are very often also supported and financed and interestingly supported and trained about by, private, by, by, by the private sector. We also need very frankly, solid academic work. Uh, because in the complexity of environment in which we operate, bringing more targeted needs assessment is of essence. And more granular, more evidence-based, more targeted needs assessment cannot be done necessarily in the same way as past humanitarian relief operations could be done. Today, we need to have a much more evidence-based and sophisticated approach to where communities have needs. We can't just carpet cover uh, a needs landscape which we can sustain over time. So we have to, to, to have, be much more granular, much more understanding on what needs of communities are, and these needs are always the same. It's security for communities, education for kids, jobs for adults, and income for adults. And I think that's where I see humanitarianism evolve. Not that this replaces what we have traditionally done. When a population of 300,000 is displaced within a week, you need to run an emergency operation. But after a month or two, you need to give a perspective. A perspective needs a different kind of support and needs different kinds of partners for us. We are not good at education, but we, have not, we are not experienced educationalists. But what we can do as ICRC is negotiate a space in which kids can go into safe schools. But supporting schools in hyper-fragile contexts 
has to be done by others. So we look for partners with specialized specializations in education. We are not specialized specialists in market creation, but if we want to help those displaced, the millions displaced, we need to give them a perspective and we need to partner with educational and knowledge programs which come from different quarters. That's where partnerships come in and where I think uh, the future also of humanitarianism is increasingly given the complexity of needs, the development of the, of the landscape of needs and also of the huge discrepancy with which we are confronted today between exponential needs and relatively modest increases of government funding for transfer money into humanitarian contexts. Thank you. I uh, just want to make an announcement. Uh, we already have a number of questions in the Q&A, but I want to make sure that all, I mean, uh, all the participants know that uh, on their screen they have a Q&A button uh, and if they want to uh, ask a question they should uh, click on that button and uh, type uh, their, their, their question. Um, Peter, uh, I have a question that will be of great interest to all the, the CEPA students, students who want to make the world a better place. I mean, you, you have those 19,000 uh, people uh, around the world, uh, some international, some local. Uh, among the international, I'm sure that there are many, there are some SIPA students, but I would want to, uh, to hear from you, what is the profile of a peace builder? Because you, as you said, you are peace builders. Uh, humanitarian action is, uh, is ground zero of trust, but as you just said, you, it's a process and you gradually uh, prepare people for, for peace. So what do you want uh, from your, uh, from your staff? What are the qualities, what is the kind of training uh, that they need uh, tomorrow to be the peace builders that will uh, do the job that needs to be done? Well, I think uh, as I have illustrated, of course, we don't need only one profile uh, because when you are becoming a, a large organization with a broad mandate in law policy and operational delivery on the ground, you, you want to have a broad range of profile. But two qualities or types of qualities stand out and I wanted uh, maybe to start with that. On the one side, this is an organization which is based on proximity and frontline negotiation. We need people who have courage and uh, have an ability to operate with others and to negotiate, uh, willing to negotiate and to engage, to engage with others who are able to be in the Prime Minister's office today and in a shelter in the afternoon and who are able to do this, this work on the ground, which is absolutely essential. And, and then you want to have people who are professionals of some of the key activities we are developing. Uh, you want to have water specialists, you want to have nutritional specialists, you want to have medical doctors, uh, you want to have nurses, you want to have public health specialists, you want to have people who are good professionalists, but are also able to improvise and who may have education at high tech places like Colombia, but also can translate this into more difficult contexts. And I think at the end of the day, uh, we look at certainly people who find this right balance between personal motivation to do something good and the ability to remain neutral, impartial, reasoned, evidence-based, scientific and sober. 
And I think that's the personal dilemma and bandwidth also we need. We can't just have people who want to do good at all price. That's dangerous. That's dangerous at frontline. You want to have motivated people in our work, but those who are realistic enough to see the dangers, to understand the difficulties. And so I think these, these two profiles on one more on the negotiating side and the other more on professional tasks we have to fill in humanitarianism are, are absolutely essential. The, the longer you stay in the organization, I expect people to be good managers. We can't afford to manage badly an institution at 2 billion and 19,000 people. And you want to have people who have commitment and you want to people who have the ability to be diplomats and lawyers and to, to argue their way through some of the biggest difficulties. I've, I think, Jean-Marie, the two of us, we have been in both, uh, on both sides. And if there is something I have carried into the ICRC, I think it's uh, my determination also to build bridges between frontline experience and political influence and diplomatic influence. And, and I think those who are attracted by this bandwidth and are people who we like to recruit and just that uh, maybe on a sober note that you know, despite all the dangerous situations in which we operate, uh, we care a lot about the security for our staff and we train and do the best we can to respond to our duty of care. But it is also true that worldwide, a lot of people are interested to work for us. For every open job at the ICRC, you, we have hundreds if not thousands of people applying. We had every year two to 300 mobile staff, uh, which positions which are open and we have between 15 and 20,000 applications. So uh, we look for the rare people who cover all those different knowledge, uh, kinds of personal and professional skills. Very, very useful. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to look at a few questions that are already uh, uh, in the uh, Q&A box. And one of them is by Jake Sherman, who, who, are, who says that you spoke about ICRC's accumulated experience with frontline negotiations, and in Yemen, its complementary relationship with the work of the UN Special Envoy. Could you say more about the transferability and differences of ICRC's experience negotiating humanitarian access to other, organi uh, difference to other organization directly involved in peacemaking whether at local or national uh, levels? Well, I think that uh, the, uh, the challenge and of transferability are, are basically in the nature of the institution. If you negotiate for the UN and uh, Jean-Marie, you are a, a great example you know what it is to negotiate for an organization which is governed by states. Uh, that gives you a certain assets because you are negotiating on behalf of states and the secretary general, and it gives you clout, legitimacy and power in your hands for the negotiation. But you are, you are then also limited by interests of states. If I look at the ICRC, we are not governed by states. We are a Swiss association governed by 25 independent Swiss people who are the governance of the ICRC. Uh, we have a mandate from states, but we are not governed by states. 
And our exclusively humanitarian mandate gives a certain type of activity that, that we can do. So there is certainly a, a reason why we need to know from each other when we are operating increasingly in the same space and with the same actors, but not necessarily on the same agenda and with this exactly the same purpose. And so the delicacy is to, un to have a deep understanding of the complexity of a negotiating environment, which can, where humanitarian, human rights, political negotiations, domestic and international components are together, but then at the same time also to see what is the role and responsibility and distinction that we carry with us for, and that each one has to fulfill. So my biggest challenge today is not so much transferability, from the political to humanitarian or humanitarian to political, but it's more complementarity of efforts knowing that each one has potential possibilities and restrictions, which are different from the one to another. And I think understanding these dynamics and having an approach of building blocks, bringing these pieces of Lego together so that at the end we have a house is what the big uh, challenge is. Within humanitarian negotiation, negotiators, we have transferability between institutions. And that's the reason why the center of competence of our humanitarian negotiations that I have mentioned is a great institution. We bring for the first time ICRC, HCR, MSF and World Food Programme Frontline, frontliners together. As long as they have a common language of humanitarianism, there is transferability and there is training and there is peer uh, review and there is, there is solidarity amongst peers evolving. But between the political negotiation of a deal and the humanitarian negotiation of a neutral and impartial space, uh, we need also to understand the distinctions, possibilities and limits of organizations. Thank you. I have a question from, uh, actually I recognize the name of a former student of mine. Uh, and uh, she asked, Miriam Bensky, the title of this event asks uh, if conflict resolution is due for a makeover. Taking into account the very timely current global conversations about racism, patriarchal masculinity and abuse in international organization, could you comment on how the ICRC and our other conflict resolution organizations are addressing the lack of diversity and inclusion within in this, in this field? Yes, I'm happy to do so. First, uh, to recognize that I do believe indeed that uh, peacemaking, peace building is ripe for a makeover. Uh, even if as a, an organization with more than 150 years uh, uh, activity as the ICRC, I would also say that makeover doesn't mean that everything which has been in the past is wrong in the present and future. So one of the difficult issues with the word makeover today is what do we have to preserve and where do we have to change? I think uh, diversity today in the institution is uh, a, a, a big transformation and pathway which uh, uh, we have embarked on for quite some time already and which further uh, needs to be chartered in order to be able to operate in the future. We are convinced today that if you want to root peace in societies, if you want to understand societies in which you operate, whether you deliver humanitarian assistance or whether you do something else, you need to have in, in your organization 
the understanding of these societies, and this comes with having or representing the diversity of views and cultures and sensitivities. And I don't think that we are there yet uh, in terms of uh, staff diversity. You know that the ICRC 30 years ago was uh, mobile staff was exclusively reserved to Swiss. We were an exclusively Swiss organization in our mobile staff. In, uh, in the 90s, ICRC opened. Today we are 140 nationalities. So the big challenge today is not so much the number, but is to bring those who have been recruited and made careers in the past also to give them progress possibilities into the highest uh, 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 functions of responsibilities in the institution. And that's the reason why we have built in our HR policy over the last 10 years, we have built a lot of bridges between local and mobile uh, employees so that you can move from being a local employee into a manager and I think these are important pathways which allow us today to be increasingly uh, diverse in, where, in, our, uh, in our composition of staff and uh, in the way also we respond, uh, we respond to the complexity of situations in which we are. My sense is that there are not only uh, diversities in terms of race and culture and religious and cultural origins. We are looking also in diversity of local and international experience, uh, of having different horizon of gender, obviously. And, and I think as you rightly say, the big transformational movement is at the end of the day to bring those tangentials of diversity into our organization. We are moving along. We have all our HR policies, action plans to get there. I think we have done quite a way forward in uh, being today recognized as a local organization as well as an international organization in many places, but uh, we are certainly not, not yet there. Thank you. I have a question from uh, Alpaslan Ozerdem. What specific impact do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on the trajectories of peace globally? Well, in those contexts in which we operate, it has definitely been a complicating factor of, uh, in many of the societies. COVID-19 has just come on top of everything else, which we have already been dealing with in a very precarious way. It has come on top of dynamics of violence and conflict. It has come on top of climate change having an impact of fragile societies. And, it has certainly disenfranchised in many of the contexts in which we operate, in particular, those who have precariously participated in, in the informal economy. You know that COVID-19, in particular, in, in fragile contexts, has less been of a, a health crisis than it has been a socio-economic crisis, uh, basically uh, taking the carpet uh, under their feet of those who were living out of the informal economy. And I think it has definitely highlighted and heightened through the socio-economic impact tensions in society. It has led to more stigmatization and more violence in, in many of the contexts in which you operate, also societal tension. We have been really irritated to see that it has even increased attacks on hospitals, health workers, 
and health facilities in all the places we have seen a steep increase. So despite the fact that these are the most crucial operators in a pandemic, attacks on health facilities have uh, again spiked uh, through the pandemic. So that's all which is complicating factor. And then in a couple of contexts in which we operate, we had positive signals uh, also of belligerence responding to the appeal of the Secretary General, basically using COVID-19 as a smokescreen to approach the other side in a conflict. Having a good excuse to, to approach the other side, reaching out to the other side in order to start negotiation. We have seen it, for instance, in the Anglo-Saxon parts of Cameroon. Uh, I would also count Ukraine in a certain respect. The some improvements that we have witnessed as an effort to use COVID-19 as a common challenge under which you could reunite without making a concession in the interest which has divided you before. And I, saw, I think we see a bifurcation today of situations. On one side, where COVID has accentuated the conflict through unfortunate socio-economic secondary impacts and further complications, and other areas where diplomacy has, it, it has created a space for diplomacy. I truly believe at the end of the day that it is only an opportunity if the international community also creates it and supports it as an opportunity. And I think that's where sometimes I, I feel we have to be careful not to miss opportunities of COVID-19 being an entry point into negotiation. I have never seen so many directors of prisons approaching the ICRC and willingly giving us access to prisons, which allows us to see those people who often are imprisoned because they are the adversaries in a conflict. And so COVID has opened prisons because of the fear of the pandemic spreading out of prison situation and promiscuity into the society. And it has created opportunities for us to engage much more forcefully for humane conditions in prison, which we consider is one of the stepping stone again, and one of the critical element of building trust and bringing societies together. And so you see this ambivalence of COVID-19 and I consider it a, a big task that we understand the call of ceasefire of the Secretary General not as a switch, a light switch, which we can just easily put on and off, but we see it as a, as a demand on us to use COVID-19 for more engagement to bring parties together to start dialogues, to look at what are the common challenges and how do we face them. And at the end of the day, this is our experience from a lot of work in conflicts that peace building is not only an issue for which the international system has to create environments and conditions. It's also an issue which you have to grow bottom up. And I think COVID-19, because of the fact that it touches each and everybody individually, has become a powerful option to start diplomacy. And I think that's how we should try to understand it and not get depressive by the negative impact, which we hopefully can hedge. I like this optimistic take on COVID-19. We badly need it. 
uh, those days. Uh, I have a question. I'm not sure you can answer it, but uh, Asad Hanna is asking, uh, asking, in percentage, how much from the aid food supply the ICRC manages, uh, distributes, uh, how much uh, is kept neutral, and how much is diverted? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I can tell you that we have a lot of control systems in place which allow us not to be completely flawless, but uh, to have in, in, the, in the ranking and oversight structures of the international community an exceptionally good reputation for uh, low percentages of, of stealing and deviation. What I can say is uh, we don't, negotiate with those who want uh, who want us to negotiate with us diversions of aid. Uh, we may have to abandon cars if we are blackmailed to be shot. Uh, so this happens. That's part of an environment in which we live today. But uh, we are in uh, in low digit number of percentages of deviation uh, overall of or or suspected deviation and it touches uh, uh, very low percentages of budgets uh, of icrc uh, in the one two percentage maximum uh, at in the worst years uh, that we may encounter thank you and i I know that the ICRC is probably one of the most trusted organizations in, in the world. Uh, I have a very practical question from Natalia Alexander. In your talk, you mentioned the, hand, the handbook that you have developed. Is it available for purchase? Yes, it's even, I think it's even available for free. <laughs> even better. I, I will ensure that you get, uh, you, you get the indications, but uh, Google the Center of Competence for Humanitarian Negotiation, CCHN, and you most likely should find uh, the handbook uh, downloadable. If, uh, if you don't, I will ensure that uh, Jean-Marie can in his first uh, course, <laughs> or even before, uh, or Merit can, uh, we, we will let you know. Huh? Thank you. Uh, a forward-looking question uh, uh, from Gloria Moronta. Uh, could you elaborate on the challenges of new technologies and cyber warfare for international humanitarian law? How is the ICRC dealing with these issues? Where does he see the field going in this regard? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, it's, it's one of the key pillars uh, uh, in of our present priorities, obviously. Uh, we, as you may know, through the Geneva Convention, the ICRC has also a mandate to engage with states on the development of new weapons technologies and new situations in conflict and to advise on the adequacies of the law or to propose to states uh, action with regard to the legal framework. Uh, our reading at the present moment is basically the following. We seem to have a relatively large consensus in the international community that in kinetic warfare to the extent that cyber-based weapons are used, that these uses of cyber-based weapons in the context of kinetic warfare doesn't change anything with regard to the applicability of international humanitarian law. If you use a cyber attack in the context of an international or, or uh, internal armed conflict, then you are held through cyber, uh, in cyber attacks to respect IHL as you have with kinetic attacks, uh, respecting precaution, distinction, uh, and proportionality, and all that comes with it and which are obligations under international humanitarian law. It's much more complicated when we are in the gray zones 
that uh, we discussed at the beginning of this conversation. And the gray zones are basically cyber attacks outside of a context of internal or international armed conflict. And there, I think the international community is still very much divided. And we do believe that different legal systems today have to be drawn in order to frame uh, the, the issue. But I think our basic approach is that there must be limits of the use and that some of the use of cyber attacks as there are limits of the use of force in other situations. And we, this is an issue which needs international negotiations and for, of which everybody knows there are deep divergences in the international community and no immediate consens consensus uh, in the pipeline. So we have, uh, we do engage bilaterally uh, in groups of countries in order to explore the possibilities of the adequacy also of using some of the basic principles of IHL in order to cope with those situations. But we are also aware that we will make and have to make reference to other legal system and eventually also define the gaps in the law which need uh, basically intergovernmental uh, negotiation. For us, cyber is also another important issue and I wanted to mention it here because of the core theme that you are discussing at SIPA and uh, it goes again back to trust. At the end of the day, uh, we, with the datafication of every aspect of life, including humanitarian work, it is obvious that our work is increasingly data-based. But our work is also done in context in which data and the protection of data is of essence. Because while we have been focusing on protecting people, in today's and future conflicts, you have also to protect the data of people. Imagine that data that we collect, prisoner data, family data, uh, weapons bearers uh, information is shared, is accessed by everybody that would give possibilities and capacities to wage war in an even more intensified way. And so the protection of data linked to the protection of populations is something which is a critical issue at the ICRC and on which we focus a lot and we negotiate a lot with uh, in order to see what the best practical, legal and political pro protection we can offer to humanitarian work and which allows us to be a depository of data, to use those data for humanitarian purposes and at the same time not expose people to risk which are linked to unprotected data. So I wanted to highlight that because I do believe that the datafication of every aspect of life will also inform how we think about peace building and peacemaking. Impossible not to keep this dimension in a research program in particular. And it goes then into the third dimension, which is so important for us, is, is analytical. We need data today in order to be sharper, preciser, and more accurate in where needs are and how we deliver humanitarian services. We need data-based tools in order to do cash services to people. As everybody knows, humanitarian work has seen a big transformation from delivering goods to supporting affected population by cash. You can't do cash transfers on cell phone without a solid database, which again needs particular protection because we are operating in delicate and sensitive zones. And that's maybe the big difference between natural disasters 
and conflict. While in natural disaster, there is a broad consensus that you should broadly uh, share data, that you are allowed to uh, use data, that drones are fine to make assessment. This is not at all the case in conflictual relationship where all these tools are rather contributing to suspicion than to trust building. Under which condition can we make data an element of trust and not an element of further divisions is a big question. Thank you for a very, very important uh, answer to a very difficult topic. Uh, question from Wan Yang. How do non-state armed groups react when ICRC talks to them, trains them on international humanitarian law? Are there any real life cases where IHL training changed the behavior of these groups? Yes, uh, the bandwidth of reaction is, uh, is huge from, from positive, interested, willing to refusing dialogue. You have everything. Uh, the good thing about my organization is that we are uh, persistent and we don't take a no for a no, uh, in particular when there is a conflict ongoing. But you have huge differences in what generally is referred to as, as non-state non armed groups. The, the most likely cases and that's maybe an interesting element I can bring in without qualifying or going too much into contextual details, which uh, I can't really do here, even if uh, uh, this is kind of a Chatham House type of conversation. But uh, a lot of non-state armed groups consider themselves governments in the making. And those who have visions of being governance type of institutions, running social services, uh, managing territory and people and services, those institutions sooner or longer are more positive towards engagement with the ICRC than those organizations who, in terms of strategic priorities, are first and foremost designed to <coughs> destroy the international system. So you, you see huge discrepancy. I wanted maybe to highlight an interesting study that we have made and which is linked to your question. We have looked at effect and impact of our training and IHL work with state and non-state actors. And what we have seen is that the readiness to discuss with us and the impact of what we do with regard to respect of international humanitarian law with state and non-state groups is intrinsically linked to the structure of those groups and not to the nature of their character. What does that mean? When you are an organization with, which is hierarchically structured and has strong hierarchies, then normally training is, top-down training is quite successful. So we know that more training gives better results. The longer we train armed forces, hierarchically structured armed forces, the less violations of international humanitarian law we see. It's mathematical, it's easy. The more difficult context is with destructured organizations and organisms. That can be state or non-state. And there we have seen that a lot of factors influence behavior, peer pressure, informal codes of behavior, societal influencers, religious influencers, families, communities. And that's the reason why we never 
Today, when we talk to unstructured actors in the battlefields, we never have an approach of just dumping training on them. We always try to have multifactored influencers. For instance, we, we talk to imams in the Islamic world to issue fatwas with regard to the behavior of fighters. That's quite powerful when we have an important imam telling fighters that you shouldn't torture prisoners and that you shouldn't violate uh, certain rules which are also the rules of Islam. We have a lot of success when women organization in community tell their men to stop and to behave. And it is interesting to see that these dynamics are possible. So there are dynamics of influences. There are entry points of influence, uh, of influences. And I think there is still in behavioral science a lot to do, which again links to SIPA's program and would be a great sort of research question also to look into. How can we change behavior of people and how, what are the tools and instruments which promise success and impact with regard to different contexts, different groups and different sensitivities we are working at. We make some experiences, we have some hypotheses, but there is a long research and evidence-based way to charter forward. Well, you, you almost answered a question that I was going to ask, actually a question of Natalia, another question of Natalia Alexander, who was asking, would evidence-based approaches include more micro-level analysis, particularly from psychologically and neurobiologically informed research and strategies? Uh, very close to what you just said. Uh, there's another yeah, question. I can still uh, maybe say one word. Huh? We consider ourselves an organization uh, committed to multiple methodologies and, and multiple approaches. And Natalia, you will see when you read our strategy that evidence-based is almost on every second page. I think it's intrinsically linked to the identity of a neutral organization. Because when you are neutral, you want to base what you do on objective evidence. And it goes into needs assessment, it goes into evidence for behavior, it goes into evidence of violations, it goes into evidence of everything we do. And I wanted to highlight that, and we are interested to explore new methodologies. I think there is no rocket science. Everybody has seen how, for instance, mental health, psychosocial support, and, and behavioral sciences have become areas of work in humanitarian contexts. And that's a new area, a new needs landscape, which has developed over the last couple of years. And we are certainly interested to take advantage of whatever innovative approach comes, uh, be it in this, or in neuroscience or in other scientific areas, which help us understand the landscape in which we operate, the needs which we are addressing. And therefore, I just wanted to signal our interest and openness uh, uh, on, in this multiplicities of methodologies and approaches. Um, the last question from, from the audience, and I have my own question that I would ask, want to ask you. From Laura McCready, speaking of the importance of partnerships for addressing the changing nature of conflict, what role do you envision for regional organizations, including the African Union, in conflict resolution, peace building, and in the delivery of humanitarian assistance? And my own question is a more personal one. Um, the, the, uh, the role and the respect that the ICRC uh, enjoys in, in the world, I mean, it's uh, 19,000 staff, but it's also your own uh, personal commitment and engagement, Peter. And I, 
I think we would all be interested in hearing from you in those eight years you have been at the head of this great organization. What's your best moment? What was your best moment? And what was your worst moment? If you can share uh, your thoughts. I start with the easy question, which gives me time to mobilize my brain for the difficult question. Uh, the regional organization are increasingly important actors, not in each and every place of the world in the same way, but it is obvious that over the last 10 years, our interactions with the African Union, with ECOWAS, with the OSCD in Europe, with ASEAN in the Asias, with uh, different outfits of regional organization in Latin America, has substantively identif uh, intensified, in particular in terms of policy and law, but also to the extent that these organizations are operationally active on the ground in terms of interaction with them on the ground. So each organization, each regional organization has a different profile. Some of them have operational activities, then of course we we, op we engage, operate, coordinate, cooperate, and explore complementarities as we do with any other actors who is there on the ground and in the theaters of activities in which we are. But then most of these organizations are important and have entered either policy or legal negotiations which create frameworks, interpretations, which are linked to international humanitarian law. So we engage with them. We have a major engagement over the last couple of years with the African continent on the Kapala Convention on Internally Displaced People. Uh, ICRC has been together with HCR, a, a major driver of informing, engaging regional organization to create that framework, which is as one of the single most important legal frameworks on the African continent to protect internally displaced people. And so this is just one example, but we have interfaces on the ground in policy and legal terms with all these legal organizations. You know, for instance, ASEAN is interesting. They have created, uh, faced with some of the humanitarian crises in the region, they have created their own humanitarian entity. And ICRC has contributed to the conceptualization of ASEAN humanitarianism. It's in our interest, we, we don't need to do everything ourselves. It's in our interest that regional organization, international organization, multilateralism functions. And therefore we are committed to whatever we know and see also to strengthen capacities of those organizations and eventually to cooperate with them as uh, they develop their policies uh, and activities. The best and worst moments. Look, the best moments, there are many best moments uh, at the ICRC, despite the difficulties that we are normally dealing with. And the best moments are always those where you feel that you are relevant and have impact. At the end of the day, if I can be open. I have been 25 years a diplomat for Switzerland. And I dare say that not every day of being a diplomat, I had the impression of doing something relevant and something impactful. And Jean-Marie has seen me when he was the Under Secretary General sitting in big meetings of the UN. And we both know that not every meeting and every moment is a moment of impact and relevance. So uh, at the ICRC, the immediacy of impact and relevance and the fact that you feel and you see it is something which is motivating, it is satisfying, it is what keeps those 19,000 people driving despite the fact that they deal each and every day and each and every minute with extremely difficult situations of suffering, of uh, violence, of difficulties, but you also see that you can contribute 
to do something better. And I would say to the address of SIPA that, as I mentioned before, that you do something which is a contribution on a longer pathway. The worst moment, that's also a little bit difficult. There are, there are difficult moments to which you get used and you have to get used when you are president of the ICRC. And some of the difficult moments are rather in the, in the interaction with some of the political leaders with which I interact and negotiate for access for a license to operate in the country in which they are. And I think what some of the worst moments are, those interactions where you feel, uh, I would say, ignorance and indifference towards the contexts and the populations over which they govern. And though I have still in front of my eyes some of those conversations with leaders of countries and organizations when they doze and gaze away when unpleasant issues come to the table and you see that they don't care, that's difficult because most of the time an hour later, I'm most of the time confronted with the impact of indifference. And that's not a good moment to be in. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very inspiring uh, conversation and very inspiring response at the end. Um, Dean Najat. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've reached the end of our time, but I just want to add my appreciation for your very, very inspiring and informative uh, words. Thank you, Jean-Marie. I think of us as a place that is analytically rigorous, that is committed to be problem solvers, that are trying to train people to think rigorously and be able to move from the prime minister's office to the field. So. It's wonderful to hear your remarks, to be inspired uh, by your example and to learn from you. So thank you very much. We hope to bring you back again and to keep you uh, in our community even more actively. Thank you for being with us. Well, from my side, I wanted to thank you. It's a, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a great opportunity for me. Uh, as we all got used to do virtual, uh, that we get into a habit uh, of uh, this type of exchange, which is certainly not what person-to-person -person exchanges are. So I hope that one of the next time I'm uh, approaching New York, I can see you, Merit, uh, Jean-Marie, uh, and, and all of you uh, in, in person. But I really appreciated uh, the excellent questions and I wanted to thank uh, for having me. Thanks a lot. <laughs>